All right, so I'm going to share my screen and we're going to go ahead and look at Genesis chapter 2 and our Genesis chapter 2 from verse 21. Now we're going to finish this one, 21 to 24. Um, day one, we looked at how God made a garden and put the man in the garden. So your assignment preceded you. As soon as your assignment, the company was created and the position was created, then God created man for that position and equipped that man to take care of that garden, right? And that's why we see, you know, he, he had muscles and everything that he needed to take care of the garden. So he was supposed to tend and keep it. And when he tended and keep, kept it, then he got paid and God told him, your payment is to eat and enjoy. You will eat freely of everything that you, you, it comes up in the garden, it, uh, you eat. So he was given a job, he was paid, but he was told, you cannot operate this job in your own knowledge and wisdom, right? You must rely on my knowledge and wisdom, not yours. The Holy Spirit will help you with your God-given assignment. So you are here because there was assignment made for you. And you are actually, your provision is connected to your assignment and you're not allowed to do the assignment in your own wisdom, only God's wisdom. Because you see, whenever they uh, went in to find their own wisdom, that's when they fell and they were taken out of the, the kingdom, the, the garden, and, the, and they were fired because they tried to do things out of the company's, um, you know, it wasn't the company's policy, all right? So... And then God said, it's not good that man should be alone. Why? Because he was doing the work that he was created to do. So the part that God decides that it is time for you to have a spouse is after you have realized what your assignment is, you are actually busy doing your assignment and you are enjoying the fruits of your assignment and you are being led by the spirit of God because the knowledge is supposed to come from God himself who gave you the garden, right? How to run that garden. All right. Secondly, as you're doing your God-given task and you're busy doing your assignment, then he says, it is not good. You need a, a, a PA. There is, and we, when we came to realize that you can never hire somebody, an assistant, if you don't have a job, what are they going to assist you to do, right? So you get, a, you get hired, you're busy doing your work. It becomes to a place now, it is growing because you are doing a lot and it is growing. And now you need an assembly to assist you because you're productive. So as you're productive in your God-given assignment, then God decides, says, uh -uh, it is not good for you to work alone. I'm going to give you a personal assistant. And then a spouse is given, right? And God was looking for somebody who was, we say, comparable comparable he tried to be he, he made the birds in the air he he made the you know any all the animals and adam just called them called them called them but there was nobody that no helper that was found comparable to him no one had that thing vision the same vision that he had or the ability to help him in that assignment okay so actually we just added more work now he has the birds of the air. He has all these animals. Now he really doesn't even have a helper that is comparable to him. So comparability is very important. The minute that you and your spouse do not even first know your assignments, you came in just because of culture or you get at, at a certain age, people need to get married. You don't know what you are called to do, yet you have a personal assistant. That's why people clash. You're fighting. Why? Because you don't know what your assignment is. You, uh, you, you hired me into, into your company and you don't even have any job. You, you are just sitting around and I'm wondering what am I here to do? So that's why you get people clashing because we are doing marriage out of God's purpose and will. It never came until Adam was in his assignment, busy doing his assignment, led of the Holy Spirit of God and doing what he was called to do. That's when God said, "Ah, uh -uh, it is not good for man to be alone. But if you do not have all that, then God is not going to say it is not good for you not to be alone. Yeah, you continue alone because it is good for you to stay alone and not in, involve somebody else in your dysfunctionality, right? You must be productive in the kingdom for you to get an assistant. All right, marriage is about your kingdom purpose. The spouse comes and it says until death do, does you part. And we saw it because it's supposed to be anti to help you with your kingdom purpose until they die or until you die, until you transition. Children of God, God don't die, they transition. And then you can get another kingdom 
you know, purpose helper until they transition again. Why? Because your assignment follows you to eternity, right? And if you're not able to know your assignment or to get an assistant for your assignment or you do your assignment, then you have a problem with your eternity. You do have a problem with your eternity. You do not get on a, you, you don't concentrate yourself on the earthly realm because the marriage is only on the earthly realm to help you with your kingdom purpose. So if you choose your marriage over your kingdom purpose, then you, you got it all wrong. Because marriage ends here. And the minute that you choose marriage over your kingdom purpose, when you go onto your other side where you're supposed to live forever and ever, then you're in trouble with God. Who, and you have no investment in, your, in the kingdom purpose. So let's go now to the what today. Let's see what is comparable. Comparability, 21 to 24. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. Okay, that is so detailed right there. So God made him to sleep. <coughs> Basically, you're dead to self. I'm going to make you go to sleep, right? And then take one of your ribs. And instead of putting another rib in that place, I'm going to close it up. Why? Because I am putting a part of your assignment and a part of what you have inside a spouse that I will make or create for you, a comparable partner. The reason for comparability is that rib. A part of the assignment is put in your spouse. So it makes you comparable. So you're not acting on this other side in totally opposite directions. No, the comparability, only God does that. Adam didn't have anything to do with it. Nobody had anything to do with it, but God. So the comparability of your assignment, it is God who actually chooses somebody your spouse and puts a part of your assignment or you in that spouse so that you can get the assignment and it's a part of your assignment why because you are created and formed according so that you can be able to fulfill your assignment so your creation how you were created and everything that was put in you during creation was to fulfill the assignment it was to help you fulfill your assignment so what do we say then that your spouse for them to be comparable, they must have your rib. They must have a part of you in them, okay? So that they can help you and you can work in sync to fulfill the assignment that God has in your life, right? And you also have a part of them because realize that when the rib went into Eve, when the rib was in the woman, a part of the man was in the woman and a part now of the woman is in the man because now the rib is from the man and the, and the woman has been made into a rib. So they both have the same, they become one. The two become one, right? There, there's, the man has a part of what the woman has. The woman has a part of what the man has. A lot of times you just look at it on one side that, oh, she's, she has my rib. No, you also have her rib, why? Because now she has your rib, but you have the rest of the ribs, meaning, you have a part of what she has now. It doesn't matter how many ribs you have. She had one, you had the many, you are part of, she, you have a part of her, she has a part of you. And that makes you comparable. And only God can do that. Man had nothing to do with it. That's why he went to sleep. Cause he would have an, a, a, and say, hey, this is what I want. Hey, make it like this, make it like that, no. The creator of the assignment, the creator of man and woman, the creator of all this is the one who is who takes that rib and who takes that assignment and who takes that part of it and puts it in your spouse because you don't even have the whole picture of what your assignment is. You get revealed to bits by bits. That's why you rely on the Holy Spirit of God to get you through your assignment. Do you understand? So don't let's not think so shallowly as if that, you know, oh, this woman is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. This is a 23. Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. In other words, he realized she is me and I'm her. We are one. There is no, there is no separation. Whatever assignment I have, 
God has put in her. Whatever assignment she has, God has put in me. In other words, we are now comparable, right? We are working in sync. And therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Wife, why? Because kingdom assignment supersedes your father and mother and brothers and sisters and family. It is not a family thing. Marriage was not meant to be a family thing. You are not supposed to be married to join a family. You married to leave your family. People get married and join a family. No, you are actually married to leave, not to join. You are married to leave your father and your mother and to be joined to your wife and become one flesh. So the problem we have in marriages is that we have decided to do marriage our own way. We have decided to get married for all the other reasons than God had intended. And then we decided we're not gonna leave our father and mother. We are actually gonna introduce our spouse and bring them in to join our father and mother. When God says leave and you say join, then you have a problem. When he says, leave your father and mother and cling to your wife, and then you say, no, I am actually going to change this equation and I'm going to bring my wife to my father and mother so we can live with my father and mother. You got it all twisted. You can never fulfill your assignment. You will never realize your spouse's assignment that way. She was not created for you to bring her to your family to stay there, no. The reason for her, your creation was your assignment. The reason for her coming to help or him coming to help is because of your assignment. The comparability is done in heaven by God himself. He joins you. Remember, as we were talking yesterday, somebody had a question and they said, they asked, so what, is it the woman who's supposed to go and um, look for a man or does the man go to look for the woman and it was like oh men are hunters you know obviously the, the the thing but today the holy spirit is saying this adam didn't go to look for eve he did not go to look for her either god brought eve to him god brings you the comparable spouse God is responsible to bring your comparable spouse. Be about your father's business. Don't go start looking for women. The reason why we have infidelity and lust and because you have to try this one, try that. The reason why we are all over the place is because we are going to look for them. Where in the scripture has it been told that you're going to look? A man should go and look for a wife. No, Adam did not go and look for Eve. God never even put Eve somewhere for Adam and, and say, okay, now uh, there is somebody that you, I have made for you. Now go and see if you can find them. No, nah. God didn't play that game. He brought her to him. And he said, now this is born of my bone, flesh of my flesh. He understood this is my assignment. Somebody just like me. How did he understand that? God made him understand that. When God brings the spouse to you, he brings a comparable spouse. When you go looking for your spouse, you go and look for somebody who is not comparable to you. Because you have no idea about your assignment, only God does. He knows what he, he put in you during creation. So allow him to go and bring your comparable spouse to you. You be about your father's business. If you're a man, stop going to look around. Be about your father's business. Concentrate on your assignment. Concentrate on listening to the Holy Spirit of God. Concentrate on productivity in the kingdom. And allow God himself to say it is not good for you to be alone. That he will take a rib and bring that person to you. That he has actually put a part of your assignment in that to help you. The reason why you men are even going into depression, you're killing yourselves because you have gone to look for incomparable partners. You are in trouble in the homes because you are going to look. There is nowhere you have been told to look. And the Bible says, he that findeth a wife, findeth, doesn't tell you he that goes to look for a wife. No. Let God bring your wife to you. Stop looking. Let him bring the comparable partner. Be about your father's business. It is not about how well you look. Because we have seen things, crazy things happen. 
But when God brings a wife to you, he knows he has already put whatever she needs inside her to come and help you. You, you're going to look for a big butt. You're going to look for boobs. You're going to look for a face. You're going to look for how does she swing herself? You're going to look for a smile. You're going to look for all these things. And nowadays, I tell you, uh, by the time we are getting inside bed, we have already taken our wigs out. We have taken out our makeup. Some of us don't even have teeth. We have uh, the things here, retainers. And then we sometimes we have these things that we put in our butt to make it bigger so that we can trick you, so you can follow us, so we can feel good about ourselves. So we take out the butt. And then we have these things that we put on the boobs that makes it bigger. And then we have a big stomach because sometimes we have these things that we wrap on our stomach. You think it's a, hey, we have a nice waist. We'll wrap it nicely. Let me tell you, my friends, stop looking. Be about your father's business. Let him be about your business. Let him see that you need a helper and let him bring a comparable helper to you. Stop going to look because you will only find the last of your flesh and it is going to bite you white hearts. A lot of people have died. A lot of people have been killed. A lot of people have died of sicknesses and diseases. A lot of people have gathered demons all over the place because you're not about your father's business. You're going to look for your own comparability according to your own eyes and wisdom. Remember, God sees us in our nakedness. So he knows which one is the real one. So you trust him. You know, just trust him. He knows our hearts. He sees how many children we have. He sees what we, we, we lie to you about. You know, people, you can't rely on human beings these days. Nowadays, even online dating, I can put a picture of whoever I want there and pretend it's me give you and any other name. Come on, do not lean on your own understanding. Be about your father's business. You be busy doing that and ask, have the Holy Spirit bring that comparable partner to you, amen? So a lot of us, I will tell you right now, there's gonna be a shifting. There is a shifting in the spiritual realm because the king is coming and he's coming very soon. And their marriages that are not comparable, they will end. I will not lie to you. And comparable marriages that are detouring people from the will of God, from the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit is coming to bring a shift. And people are coming back to be reassigned. It's almost like a company that is going bankrupt. And they are bought by this company. And their new management is in. They have to be a rearrangement. They have to rearrange things. So do not be afraid when God starts rearranging things in your life, because it is about the kingdom business and kingdom purpose. Do not be afraid. It will be painful. I will tell you, yes. It will be hurtful. I will tell you, yes. Because I am going to share with you something that I have experienced after our speaker has spoken. It is very personal, but you will understand why there is a shifting and why I am learning as I go, all these things. Because had I known at 18 years old or 19 years old when I got married, that it is not about the good looks. It is not about the build and the height and the, and the light skin that I was looking for. My friends, comparability, I tell you, it is very important. So without any further ado, I am going to invite our speaker for the day. And his name is Reverend Albert Shitakwa. And he's going to uh, bless us today with the word that God has given him. And after the speaker has spoken, I just want you guys to please invite people as you can, as you can just invite whoever you can be able to invite, because this is going to be a very special day, a special moment. I'm going to also make an announcement, a very personal announcement at the end of this, so you do not want to miss. And if you need anybody around, just bring them in and we're going to have a very wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. Reverend Albert Shitakwa is a blessing, a very great blessing to my life, a blessing to the uh, kingdom of God, a blessing to the church of Jesus Christ and marriages. And you see, God has a way of connecting his purposes. So I, I am amazed. I learn every single day. And the way he puts things, it's just the Holy Spirit of God that gives him the wisdom to put it in such a way that you will definitely get it. So take your pens and papers, write down everything you need to get, the notes, chat, be free to chat, use the chat. It's a private chat. Nobody's going to see your chat. 
uh, apart from the people here, or you can even private chat me. If you have any questions, please feel free. Private chat me, give Zawadi love. You can always private chat me, she's a co-host, or Reverend himself. If you do not even want me to see, chat him. He's okay, right, Reverend? He'll be able to, um, to read your questions and he will um, make it anonymous. Oh, yes. So thank mm -hmm. you so much. Karibu sana. May God bless you and may we um, may he use you in the capacity that he has planned and even greater today in Jesus name. Karibu. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, Zawadi, I am honored. Uh, I trust that uh, you have had a good day, each one of you that uh, is here. I don't know whether where you are, it's morning, it's, you know, whatever time, uh, midday, it's, uh, here it's in the evening uh, in Nairobi, Kenya, and uh, always a pleasure to be uh, with us and continue to share God's word with us. And so um, uh, today I'm home and I'm with my wife, uh, Pastor Mary. Uh, she's right here with me, uh, as always, enjoying uh you know the, the 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 fellowship and yeah so she will say hello yeah and just go ahead and say hello hello i greet you all in jesus name it's a um, great joy to just join in in the fellowship and uh, we are grateful for the wisdom that we've also received from minister zawadi even from genesis and um the word of god is a blessing and that is where we draw all the truth and the wisdom to help us build our marriages and what's an opportunity to just receive wisdom from God's word even now. And uh, Proverb reminds me that um, through wisdom a house is built and by understanding it is established. That's Proverbs 24 and verse 3. And for sure, there's no other way to do it right other than the principles laid down by God in his word. So I'm ready to receive that very word. I trust you are. Let's be blessed together. Thank you. God bless you. Amen. Thank, Thank you. you so much, my dear. I love uh, you sent scriptures out there. That's amazing. I love it. Love it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Miss Mary. Mm -hmm. Pastor Mary, we love True. you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Asama, we love you. Oh, love you too. Blessings. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, through wisdom, a house is built and uh, it's established by understanding. Uh, you know, uh, it takes wisdom to build, really. It, it does. The Bible says wisdom is better than weapons of war. Wisdom is better than, uh, you know, uh, it says uh, w uh, money is a defense and so is wisdom. But uh, wisdom gives you more than just defense. It gives you life. You know, uh, wisdom is profitable to direct. Uh, so every time you encounter God's word, you are encountering uh, the wisdom of God, uh, which uh, I normally say is different from the wisdom of man. The wisdom of man will give you a temporal solution, but create a problem elsewhere. The wisdom of God uh, gives you a permanent solution and it doesn't create a problem elsewhere. So that's why it's better to draw from God's wisdom. And like uh, Minister Zawadi said, not lean on your own understanding uh, because uh, you, you, we can't trust ourselves. We, we would rather trust in the wisdom of God uh, and draw from the wisdom of God. Yeah, and, and I think last, uh, yesterday, uh, I don't know whether I mentioned that, you know, yesterday I had several meetings, so I could have said it in another meeting. Uh, where I was talking about God spoke to Moses and, uh, you know, God told Moses to build the tabernacle uh, according to the pattern that was shown to him. So God has a divine pattern on how to build. And I remember uh, last year, possibly uh, when I came in uh, at some point, I shared with us about building marriage according to the divine pattern of God. Uh, and, and so we cannot build any other way. There is no plan B. There is no another way of building. We have to build it according to the divine pattern that God has handed to us. And God has handed to us this divine pattern in his word. 
And so when we study his word, when we look at his word, we will find the divine pattern upon which we build, anything that we build. In fact, Psalms 23 and verse 3 says, he restores my soul. And then it says, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Paths is plural there. And so it tells us that there are many paths of righteousness. Uh, and righteousness is God's way of being and doing uh, stuff. So it simply put righteousness is the divine patterns of God. It's the templates of God uh, that we use to be able to print, do stuff that we do in every area of our life. So there is a righteous pattern for marriage. There is a righteous pattern for work. There is a righteous pattern for business. There is a righteous pattern for ministry. There is a righteous pattern for everything that God requires of us to do. For every assignment, there is a righteous pattern. And so he leads us. It is him who leads us in the paths of righteousness. So we need to depend on him to lead us into the patterns of righteousness that are in scripture. That's why the Bible says the word of God is profitable for doctrine, for rebuke, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. You know, so there is, there is the word of God instructs us in the divine patterns God has put for us, the blueprints, the templates that God has put for us so that we can be a success in everything that God wants us to build. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. And so if we are going to build, then we must build according to the divine pattern. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3 says, uh, every house is built by someone, but he that builds all things is God. And so Moses built, but in essence, it's God who built because Moses built based on the pattern God gave him, God showed him. So that's the pattern we have to build marriage on, the pattern that God has shown us. So it's been a journey and we continue to have that journey. Uh, and I like saying that, uh, you know, reputation is reinforcement in scripture. So I keep, as a teacher, I like building from where I came from so that we are not just uh, forgetting. You know, the Bible says, don't remove the ancient landmarks. We are not forgetting the things that we started with and we are building on that. So it's not like uh, there's a, there's, there's the generation we are in is... Uh, a generation that craves for the new when we have not applied the old. Uh, we are craving for the new revelation, but we've done nothing with what God told us yesterday. And so it's important for us to learn to build upon. Uh, you know, you don't throw away the old because the new has come. You build upon, you know, what God has given us. And so uh, we have been saying many things. And because today is our final day for this uh, month, uh, I'll just quickly in the next five minutes try to lay uh, again the foundation and then now pick it up from there as we flow. And so uh, Genesis chapter two, the scripture that uh, really is, uh, you know, uh, one of those scriptures that begins to highlight to us about uh, the divine pattern of marriage uh, in Genesis chapter 2 uh, from verse 18, where God says, it is not good for man to be alone. Uh, that scripture uh, puts into perspective the context in which marriage should be lived. One, it tells us that it is God who utters marriage and originates marriage. So marriage uh, was not our idea, or it was God's idea. He's the one who utters it and begins it. And then because it is God who utters it and begin it, begins it, uh, you know, initiates it in our lives, it therefore means that we can only go to God uh, to understand how he designed it to work. So God designed marriage, God uttered marriage, God originated marriage, it was his idea, and therefore, he is the one with a blueprint. He is the one with the design on how marriage is supposed to work. And so God designed marriage, uh, or the nature of marriage, how it was designed. Marriage was designed to be monogamous, one man, one woman. Marriage was designed to be permanent, till death do us part. Marriage was designed to be exclusive, no third parties allowed. You know, so that is exclusive. Let no man put asunder. Uh, 
designed to be the most intimate of all relations. So that means for marriage to work as God designed it to work, your wife needs to be the most intimate person in your life. Uh, your husband needs to be the most intimate person in your life. Uh, no one else should be closer to you than your spouse. You know, and, and, and so you see the progression of marriage. God says, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make him a helper comparable to him. Uh, and then the Bible says he caused man into a deep sleep. He formed the woman, brought the woman to man. And then of course, Adam spoke as he did. And then this is what the scripture says, for this reason, the uh, man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and then the two shall become one flesh. You see, that's a progression. A man shall leave, cleave, then the two shall become. You know, leave, cleave, then the two shall become. And that's why I said yesterday when we began talking about uh, intimacy, that the goal of marriage uh, in the context of living with one another one of which is intimacy, you know, uh, you know, because, uh, and this is why intimacy is important. Uh, you know, when you are not one, uh, or put it this way, when you are one, uh, according to scripture, uh, you get or you gain what we call a multiplier effect. Uh, according to scripture, one can chase a thousand, but two can chase 10,000, not 2,000, 10,000. So that means uh, when you are one as, as a couple, uh, you gain a multiplier effect. What you can do as an individual is multiply 10 times or more when you are a couple. And so that's the blessing of intimacy in a marriage. Uh, you know, that's the blessing of oneness in every aspect. Psalms 133 tells us in oneness, God commands a blessing. You know, uh, when they were in one accord, uh, the Holy Spirit came. Uh, you know, so that means the Holy Spirit doesn't function in divisiveness. Uh, the Holy Spirit functions in oneness. And that's why we need to be uh, one as a spouse. We need to be of one mind. Uh, we need to be of one accord. We need to be in sync, in agreement. A walk in agreement. Uh, the Bible says two cannot walk together unless they be agreed. So we need to walk in agreement. Uh, and, and these are principles and that can help us enhance intimacy uh, in marriage. So uh, on man, on uh, was it on Tuesday when we began on fast uh, when we began. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I've laid the foundation about God-initiated marriage, uh, God, the design and the nature of marriage. Uh, then, uh, for this reason, there is a purpose for marriage. Uh, I wouldn't labor so much on that because I've come and I've had uh, Minister Zawadi talk about that, the purpose for marriage. Uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, I talked about the, some of the pillars uh, of marriage uh, in the last time. Uh, things that are prerequisites that should be there that uh, help you to have a solid marriage. And then now, last on first, when we began this particular month, I began to help us to reflect uh, about uh, marriage. And uh, in this reflection, my, my desire was to help us to be able to uh, look at life uh, you know, from an eternal perspective. Look at life from God's perspective. Uh, Jesus says in Luke chapter 14 and verse 20, uh, 28, uh, you know, no one uh, just goes out to build a house unless they sit down first. That's a principle Christians need to learn. Uh, the principle of sitting down first. And that is a principle of planning. Uh, and in planning, it involves thinking ahead. Uh, it involves visualizing where you are headed, the destiny, the destination. Uh, it involves, uh, you know, you looking ahead. And so when you look ahead, then you back up and begin to plan towards the vision, the picture of the destiny that you have seen or that God has painted for us. 
So that's how God works. By the way. God is the God who knows the end from the beginning. So in other words, God begins with the end, then backs up and takes us on a journey to begin a journey towards the end he has already painted a picture for us for. And so in the same way, when we sit down uh, fast, it's the principle of uh, thinking ahead so that we can plan to arrive at that destiny that God has designed and painted for us uh, concerning marriage. When God told the children of Israel, deliver them from Egypt, he painted a picture of the vision, the destiny they were going. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. You know, he's taking them to this productive land. So that was a picture God was painting for them. That was a vision God was painting for them. Uh, then he now started a journey with them towards that vision. And so sitting down fast is key. And so that's why uh, Psalms 90 and verse 12 that we began with again says uh, that uh, Moses says, teach me to number my days that I may apply my heart to wisdom. So we say it that life has windows. Uh, life is one big, you know, th th there are two big, uh, major windows uh, in life, uh, birth and death. You know, every one of us has been born. The, you know, we are, we are here because we were born. And every one of us at some point will exit, will die. You know, somebody said the statistics of death are impressive. One out of every one person will die. So that tells you that uh, you are not going to live here or not forever. At some point, you will exit. And so you need to plan for that exit. You need to plan in a way that when you exit, uh, what is the legacy? What is the impact that you will leave by the time you go? And so uh, according to scripture, again, it says God has allotted us about 70 years and by reason of strength, 80 years. So anything beyond 70 is basically a bonus from scripture. So uh, we are born. Uh, we live up to 70. Going beyond 70, we are on bonus uh, based on scripture. And so you can live 100, that's still bonus uh, based on scripture. We have those people, some of our grandparents who have been, who, who've passed on at 90s, you know, that's a bonus. But so when we're talking about planning, then you plan with 70, you know, uh, because that's the allotted time uh, that we are talking about. So now we say it. 0 to 20 uh, is what you call what? Uh, 0 to 20 is the preparation stage. Uh, take it further to about 30. Then 30 to 50 uh, is the takeoff stage. Uh, you know, you prepare, uh, then take off. Uh, now, in the takeoff stage is where a lot of activity happens. Uh, that's the period in which we get married. That's the period in which we uh, bear children. That's the period in which we parent and raise our children. That's the period in which we invest, uh, you know, and, and build our careers, uh, 30 to 50. That's the period of a lot of activity uh, going on in our lives. Uh, and then now 50 is the cruise stage. You know, picture a plane. The plane, uh, before the plane takes off, there is a lot of preparation that is done to ensure that the engine is right, to ensure that everything up the fuel is there, to ensure everything about the plane is taken care of. They have restocked the plane, uh, you know, to cater for the passengers who will be in that plane. You know, there is a lot of stuff that goes on preparing the plane for takeoff. And then, uh, there is the takeoff stage, uh, which is, you know, a very critical stage uh, because they say the most uh, critical stage uh, of a flight uh, is the takeoff and the landing. And so that takeoff stage is extremely critical. You know, uh, that's when, you know, when you are in planes, you realize people are quiet when takeoff is happening. Uh, because uh, it's 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 a dicey uh, you know it's a dicey kind of place, uh, and uh, until you hear that uh, you know sound on the plane that tells you now you can unbutton your safety belt, uh, you, you almost feel like few 
the cruise autopilot stage. So, so now you can wake up, you can go about uh, stuff, you can eat, all that stuff can happen uh, because now you are at a place where you are cruising. So the cruise stage uh, is, is, is 50s and beyond. When you turn 50 years old and beyond, you're supposed to be on the cruise stage. But you need to understand, uh, as we have said, that for you to enjoy your cruise, you need to prepare well, you need to take off right for you to be able to enjoy the cruise. Otherwise, uh, that can be a very painful, difficult uh, time in one's life. So you don't wake up at 50 to a good marriage. No, it is intentional. You don't wake up at 50 uh, to a good retirement. No, it's intentional. You know, you don't wake up at 50 and you have these wonderful children who are now adults, godly, uh, love God, living well, responsible, good citizens. You don't wake up to that. You know, there is work that brings them to that place so that in your 50s, your children can either be a joy to you, like scripture says, or your children can be uh, a pain to you. You know, they can cause you a lot of pain. Uh, so what will determine that is the takeoff stage, especially. And so that's what we are focusing on. And so we said, uh, in this takeoff stage, there are several things that we need to take care of. Uh, we need to look at the issue of uh, our marriage, uh, and which is what I, I talked about yesterday, the intimacy in marriage at the takeoff stage. That's one thing we need to take care of. We, we also need to take care of, at the takeoff stage, uh, we need to take care of our health. You know, uh, you know, it's, it's an important thing. We need to take care of our financial stability. Uh, that, that's the period to, to work on that so that, you know, uh, your 50s and beyond, uh, you, you, they are good. Uh, you need to take care of the your your you know uh, bearing of children and parenting uh, of our children. We need to take care of the question of our careers. We need to take care of our contribution uh, to society. Uh, we need to take care of the issue of our uh, kingdom assignment in terms of church. Uh, you know, so. Th these are things that we need to uh, that we need to work on uh, in our takeoff stage, which is thirty to fifty, so that when we hit fifty, we don't wake up to divorce papers. Uh, we don't wake up because it happens. We don't wake up uh, to uh, a severely compromised health. Uh, you know, and probably uh, lack of financial uh, capacity uh, to take care of yourself uh, at that stage because you have no medical cover, you have no health insurance, and so and, and yet you are grappling with serious health challenges. Uh, you become a burden then to your children at that stage. And while you know, uh, right now many of us could have found ourselves in that space where we are actually taking care of our parents, uh, you know, and partly it could be because they didn't have the knowledge that now you do. Uh, and so they found themselves in a space where, uh, you know, a lot of these things were not put in place early or uh, because of the level of poverty, for example, for those uh, who've come from backgrounds that were very dire, the level of poverty in the family, uh, generations past, you find that by that your parents worked hard, they did their best, and probably their best was only to take you through school, you know, and, and, and by the time they are done taking you through school, they are in their 50s, and so you have to take care of them now. Uh, now, gen God should help us so that our generation, we should make it such that our children don't have to take care of 
that they, it makes it easier for them, you know. By the third and fourth generation, we come to alignment with the plan of God and the purpose of God in scripture, which is a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. That's the plan of God. So that we should come to a place where, you know, the generations after us have a better place to begin with than the generations before us. So the generations after us, uh, we leave an inheritance at least for our children, if not for our children's children. Then our children probably can get to that dimension where they can leave an inheritance for their children's children, their grandchildren. And that way, we are bequeathing the next generation a better legacy, you know, a, a, you know, a better beginning uh, as we progress in our life. So these are some of the things that we need to take care of. So yesterday, we now narrowed down to marriage and intimacy. And I talked about the threats to intimacy in our marriage. Uh, you know, uh, familiarity, uh, you know, the ambush of another man stroke woman. Uh, you know, if you are a man, the ambush of another woman. If you are a woman, the ambush of another man. Uh, you know, these are threats uh, to our intimacy. Another issue to, to, to that threat is uh, you know not uh, creating uh, moments where you you know not investing in your relationship with your spouse, uh, having those romantic moments, having those uh, spending time really uh, together. Uh, busyness is a threat uh, to intimacy. We can get too busy with our careers and with our work that by the time our children are adults and gone and that is the same time we are about to retire, uh, we are strangers to one another because we got too busy and preoccupied with our careers, with our pursuits, you know? Uh, you know, and even those of us who are in ministry, we can get too busy with a ministry that, you know, we lose our marriage, you know? And so we've got to be careful. That's why, you know, uh, God places a lot of premium on the marriage relationship. Uh, I keep making this joke uh, in our church and to our congregation that the church, you know, is the bride of Christ. The church is not my bride. The church is the bride of Christ. Me, I have my bride. So... Uh, I need to take care of my bride and Christ will take care of his bride and his bride is the church, you know, uh, so I, I can't die for the church because Christ already died for the church. And so I have a responsibility to take care of my wife. There are things and there are burdens that sometimes we carry as ministers. Uh, we, we carry such weights and such burdens that, uh, you know, we almost feel like we are the messiahs. You know, we get caught up with what I call a messianic complex, uh, where we think we are, if I don't do it, you know, uh, things will collapse. If I don't do it, you know, who else will? So I become like the Messiah. I want to be a hero. Uh, I need to realize that the church is the bride of Christ and the Holy Spirit uh, raises people who will be able to help you take care of the work as a minister so that you don't carry the entire weight on yourself as though you are the Messiah. You have a family to take care of, go home and take care of your family. After you do what God has told you to do, you have a family to take care of. Go home and take care of your family. You know, so busyness uh, can cause us to, uh, you know, lose our uh, intimacy. And then we find ourselves strangers at our 50s plus, we are disconnected, we are detached from one another, and you find people have lived together for so long and then it gets to that stage of their lives and they are filing for divorce, uh, you know? And yet, uh, that's the reality uh, of life. Uh, it happens because life is not ideal, you know? Uh, if both of you are not putting effort into the relationship and working towards intentionally, deliberately working towards building your marriage, then chances are uh, the marriage can fail. It will not work because only one party is putting effort and the other one is tired. 
back because both of you are putting the effort. Both of you are intentional. Both of you are deliberate to build that intimate relationship. If both of you are not intentional and deliberate to build that marriage, it will be a frustration to the one that feels like they are putting the effort and the other one is tagging along. And it gets to a place where, you know, uh, hum fatigue can set in. Compassionate fatigue can hit you. And compassionate fatigue will make you get to a place. The danger with compassionate fatigue, what I call compassionate fatigue, is that it makes you cross the threshold of caring. So you no longer care. You know, and, and so you feel nothing, uh, you know, about your spouse, you know, you lose empathy. And the problem with that then is that uh, your, your marriage is technically dead at that point, you know, and, and so we need to both put effort, it takes two, we both put effort uh, to build an intimate relationship. It is so critical and so crucial. If we are going to, the reason why God said a man needs a helper is because uh, God understood you can't do this alone. You can't fulfill the assignment of God on your own. You need a helper. And uh, this helper comes to play two significant roles, to walk alongside you, that's companionship, and to work with you as a team, that's partnership. So, you know, that's, that's, that's part of the reason why God built, I mean, established the marriage uh, union uh, so that you become, uh, you have somebody who can help you uh, fulfill God's assignment in your life. And every one of us in a marriage have an assignment, uh, you know, in our lives as individuals. And so when we come together, then we complement each other and we support each other and we help each other fulfill the assignment of God that is upon our lives. And so that's why it's important for us to understand that intimacy becomes extremely crucial, crucial for us to be able to accomplish God's assignment, for us to be able to uh, achieve the things that God wants us to achieve, for us to be able to fulfill God's agenda, which is to raise a godly generation in the context of a marriage, to raise strong churches, to raise a strong society, to raise a godly generation, uh, you know, in, in our nations, in our cities. Uh, the, the, the God's plan was all put in the context of marriage, you know, and so your, God has a stake in your marriage. That's, that's what I would keep saying. God has a stake in your marriage, you know, uh, you know because if it doesn't work, uh, you know, although uh, God's grace uh, and redemptive grace is available, even when a marriage fails, because it happens. Uh, and that's why we, if, if we talk about uh, all the possibilities that could happen at 50 and beyond. And one of those possibilities is launching alone. How do you launch alone if your marriage failed? You know, you wanted to do what you needed to do. You tried your best, but for some reason, your marriage failed because either your partner was not in on it, uh, he, was, he or she was not cooperating, uh, you know, and, and then so it compromised your marriage and your marriage failed. You did everything to work or restore and it didn't happen. And so you have to launch out alone. Yeah, I, I normally say God hates divorce, but he doesn't hate the divorcee. Uh, it's important for us to understand that, uh, you know, like there is life after divorce. I think that's critical for us to understand. You know, if, if a marriage has failed, it's not you who has failed. Uh, it's the marriage that has failed. So don't condemn yourself. Failure is not fatal. You know, uh, I think it's important to put that into perspective so that now, uh, as you look ahead, you, you forge ahead and there's a way you can launch uh, ahead even when things didn't work out uh, in a marriage relationship. And so, but God's ideal is that uh, every marriage should serve his purpose, which is to raise a godly uh, generation, one of which is to raise a godly generation. 
uh, and to fulfill, to advance the course of the kingdom by you fulfilling your assignment in God. You know, so every marriage has that purpose. Okay, so uh, so intimacy. So now today, I'll just touch on one or two things and then uh, we wrap it up for the week. I mean, for this week. And so the area that I want to touch on, uh, which I, 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 I feel is a big concern is what I've just mentioned about that next generation. And that is parenting. Uh, you know, so we say that there are several windows that open and close. And one of those windows is the window of parenting. You know, and uh, in parenting, we have different faces. You know, uh, God blesses us with children. Uh, one of the things we must always remember as parents is that we are stewards. Stewards means that we are managing something that God has entrusted us with on his behalf. A steward is one who manages on behalf of another. You know, meaning that if you are entrusted, what you are entrusted with is not really yours. It belongs to the owner who gave you. So that therefore means that the children God gives us are his. They are his creation. They are his. God has just trusted us as parents, as imperfect as we may be, with the sacred responsibility to uh, create an environment for these children to grow, to become a godly generation. And how do I know that? In the book of Malachi, chapter two, uh, you know, the Bible tells us that, you know, and he says, you know, God, God gets very angry with the guys, uh, you know, in Malachi, it, it, the, 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 his people who, especially for the men, who are, you know, are not taking good care of their, uh wives notice wives it's not even and that's why the issue of intimacy we talked about yesterday is very important you know so let me just read that particular passage it says this in malachi chapter 2 uh probably i pick it up from verse 13 and this is what it says and this is the second thing you do you cover the altar of the lord with tears with weeping and crying so he does not regard the offering anymore. He does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? In other words, why does, not, why does God not regard our offering anymore? Uh, why does he not even listen to our prayer? Because tears and crying implies prayer, you know, travailing. So why is God not listening to even our prayers? Because the Lord has been witness between you and your wife and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yes, she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. Now, that's a very profound passage of scripture. God is saying that the reason, one of the reasons why he doesn't listen to prayer, one of the reasons why he doesn't even receive the offering that we give, or God may refuse to receive the offering that we give, is when we dishonor the spouse that God has given us. So in this respect, God was in particular about the men towards their wife, because in that society, being a male chauvinist society, uh, they had, uh, you know, they had gotten to a place where they would divorce their women for every flimsy reason. They would mistreat their women. Uh, they would... Uh, dishonor their wives and treat them, you know, treacherously, treacherously, badly, you know. Uh, and, and so God was angry with how God revealed from that particular passage that he is particular in how you treat your spouse. Interesting. That God has 
interests in how you live with one another as husband and wife and how you handle one another uh, and treat one another in your marriage as husband and wife. God is particular about that. So particular, why? Because God has vested interests. What are his vested interests? The next generation. So how does me treating my wife and how I live with my wife, uh, how does that relate with the next generation? Because uh, you need to understand your home is the environment in which your children are growing in. And that is the environment that becomes the first school of what being a father looks like and what being a husband looks like, what being a mother looks like and what being a wife looks like. And so uh, it's the first context uh, that children get exposed to uh, the reality of a marriage. And so if I don't treat my wife well, I am creating a wrong model and a wrong pattern, uh, which will have a great bearing and impact on these children as they grow up, when they become adults, the imprint they got in the environment I created will influence, alter, and affect their lives almost permanently. And so that's why God has vested interests in how I handle my wife and how I treat my wife. So I can't therefore become careless with my relationship with my wife because God takes it personally. Sometimes we don't look at it like that, but when you begin to look at it like that, then you begin to be serious with the relationship you have with your spouse, because you realize, you know, uh, it's not just how you are dealing with, it's not just him you are dealing with, you are dealing with uh, his God or her God, you get? And so you've got to then handle them with care and with honor, you've got to honor that person uh, because God is the one who gave that person to you. Uh, just like the parent gave you the wife, you need to realize it's not just the parent who gave you, God gave you that person. And so you've got to take care of that person, take care of that husband, take care of that wife uh, because you recognize that God has a stake. And so therefore, that's why the issue of intimacy now becomes critical because when we build an intimate relationship, a loving environment, uh, a, a working relationship with our spouses, when we are, you know, we have a healthy communication with each other, when we have a good vibe and chemistry with each other, when we work towards uh, building a healthy relationship with one another, when we demonstrate our love for one another, uh, when we demonstrate honor and respect for one another, we bring children who grow up in that environment that have a healthy, uh, you know, uh, a healthy uh, perspective. They have a good worldview of marriage. Uh, we influence. Uh, the model, the picture of what marriage should look like and what a husband looks like and what a wife looks like. And therefore, we bequeath the society with more responsible people, uh, you know, who, uh, who will be good husbands to their wives, who will be good wives to their husbands, who will be great ministers in the process, who will be able to fulfill God's assignment. So you begin to realize that marriage is a big deal to God because it's the basic building block of society. There is no strong church without strong marriages. There is no strong society without strong marriages. You know, a society is dysfunctional when marriages are dysfunctional. A church is in crisis when marriages are in crisis, you know? And so we need to understand that God has entrusted that responsibility to really build the entire social fabric, you know, uh, in the context of marriage by how we live with one another. It begins there. And then now we get into the parenting thing, how we parent. So the window for parenting 
is the formative stages of our children. Children come to the earth like, you know, it's like a blank check. You can write whatever you want to write uh, on that check. So they come to the earth blank. And so we start filling in, uh, you know, in that blank space, we begin to put in stuff. We put in values in that blank space. We put in responsibility in that blank space. We teach them uh, spirituality in that blank space. You know, so we are the ones who are putting in stuff by the environment we uh, create for them, by the instruction that we give to them, by the discipline we bring into their lives. All those things help shape character, shape value system, shape uh, their spirituality, you know, uh, whet their appetite for God, you know, or uh, cool their affection for God, you know, de depending on what you do zero to 10, you know? So that's a window. Now I want you to think with me for a moment. During this particular window, that's the same time. Remember we are talking about 30 to 50. That's the same time we are also building our careers. Now, many times, you know, we talk about work-life balance. Many times we find ourselves very busy building our career and the excuse and, and not having time with our children or being available for them. And the excuse we give is that we are building, uh, we, are, we, are, we are working for them so that we can leave an inheritance for them. Perfect excuse, a good one for that matter because we want them to live better lives than we did in terms of, uh, you know, if we came from poverty, they shouldn't begin life where we came from. They should begin better. And so we are working hard for them. But at what cost? We are losing, this window is going to close. You know, so if I miss the opportunity to be there for my children, zero to 10 years, zero to 15 years, zero to, you know, say even, 19, 20 years, if I'm not there for my children, and especially the first zero to 10, and then the other critical stage is up to 16, 17 years old, if I am not there for my children, that window will close. When, and when it closes, you know, I lost it, I missed it. So if I was never there, I was never there. If I didn't invest, I didn't invest in them. So my wisdom uh, to mitigate that is whatever stage you find yourself in, if you realize that you, the window is now closing and it possibly could end negatively, you need to stop. Remember what he said the other day when we began, get off the train, go to the right train. Because, you know, the clock doesn't wait for no man. It keeps ticking. Life will not stop for you. It will, time will not stop. It will keep going. And sometimes it goes faster. It will keep going. And so when that, when you realize you are on the wrong uh, path or trajectory, you've not been there, you need to stop, get off the train and go to the right train. And it may mean sacrificing a lot. It may mean making certain decisions that may be difficult and painful. It may mean uh, probably considering changing your kind of job that doesn't allow you time with your children. You know, it may mean sacrificing your time, you know, for leisure and pleasure, you know, so that you are available for your children, you know, uh, so that you spend more time with your children to invest in them so that you don't invest so much for them. And when they are now adults, they cannot be able to manage what you invested for them because you never invested in them. So both investments are important, but more important is investing in them. So invest in them, even as you trust God to invest for them. 
your children by spending time with them. Quantity and quality. Invest in their children and spend time with them. They need you now. You know, if you have those children who are below 10, if you have those children who are not yet adults, uh, they need you. They need you. Now, the different phases, parenting and dynamics are different based on the stage of the child they are in. But one thing that is constant is that your children need you as long as they are under your care. They need you. You need to be there for them. When that window closes, it becomes very painful if you didn't put in the right stuff in them. By the way, if you didn't put in anything in them, somebody else is putting stuff in them. The media is. Social media is. We are living in a world where, you know, they can access anything from the comfort of your home, you know? And all those things they have access to have influences on your children. So it's important that we don't allow this window to close uh, without us investing in our children. So let's be there for them because that's one of the greatest assignments that God has given us. So let's be there for them, meaning prioritize. So how this is how you prioritize. The, the important things in your life. It's like you have this big vase and you, you, know, you have all these different stones you want to put in this vase. So you begin with the big stones. You put the big stones. What are the big stones? You need to prioritize what are your big stones. Your big stones should be your family, your marriage, your family. Those are the relationships that really matter becoming the big stones. And then now, the medium-sized stones can follow. And then after that, everything else, the sand can come in. Now, if you do it that way, you will be able to have everything into this face. But if you start with the sand, the big stones will not fit. You know, uh, if you started with the sand. So the big stones are the priority areas of your life. And there are never many. They are about four or five at most. You know? And you, in order of priority, what are these big stones? You know? So your family comes there. Your, your, your kingdom assignment, one of the areas that we tend to forget also, is a major priority. It comes there. So that you don't, uh, listen to this phrase, you don't give your best to Babylon. When you come to the kingdom, you have no more strength left in you to give anything to the kingdom because you have spent, you have been spent in giving your best to Babylon. And that's how many people are living their lives. They are giving their best to Babylon. By the time they come to church, for example, they have no strength to give anything to God, you know, because they have been slaving in Babylon, you know, uh, and that's what Babylon likes. Babylon would took the best of Egypt, I mean, of, of Israel, mm -hmm. Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and the best of the brains in, 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 uh, you know, the best of the brains, picks the best and then uh, uses them, you get. So it's important that we become careful not to give our best to Babylon. And then uh, when it comes to the kingdom of God, we have no more strength. So we need to prioritize for that to happen, for, for us to be able not to forget our kingdom assignment or... Uh, you know, like the Bible says, shall, shall Zion come to the place of birth and fail to deliver because they have no strength to deliver? You know, uh, may God help us not to come to the place of birth where God wants us to birth certain things, uh, you know, uh, to do with our kingdom assignments and we have no strength to push. 
has been laboring in Babylon. God help us uh, to prioritize that. God help us to prioritize our children. God help us to prioritize our spouses. God help us to prioritize our health. So the children issue, uh, the health issue is another critical component. Uh, you know, we must realize that uh, 50 and beyond is a vulnerable stage. Uh, our organs have been working since they, we were born. Our liver has been working. Our kidney has been working. Our heart has been pumping, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, blood into our system. Our lungs have been working, you know, all these years, 50 years uh, and beyond. By the time we hit our 50s, uh, all these systems in the body uh, begin to uh, become vulnerable. Now, what makes it difficult and worse is if we didn't do things to renew our system. You know, uh, eating right, exercising. You know, one of the things that we don't realize is uh, we keep postponing, procrastinating, uh, telling ourselves, I'll do it tomorrow. Uh, you know, giving excuses of why we are not doing it. Uh, what we don't realize, like I've said, time waits for no man. The clock is ticking. Age is catching up with us. And if we don't take care of our health now. So if you're on the wrong trajectory, get out of the train and go to the right one. You know, uh, if you need to change your diet, do. Uh, of course, let me put a caveat. We are living in a time when you go online, they are all, every person has become an expert with diet. So be careful what you also listen to and what you take. You know, uh, I think, you know, the Bible says it well. Everything is, uh, you know, exp how does he put it? Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. So in other words, uh, do, and then it tells us to do stuff with moderation. The issue is moderation, you know. Uh, and so we need to be able to uh, become very deliberate and intentional about what we are eating so that we, uh, our 50s are good. And so to this period of time, yesterday, the day before and today, my major intention was to help us look at our lives beyond 50. So I want to give you an exercise. Then I can wind up in the next few minutes. This is the exercise. I'm hoping you have somewhere, if you are not driving, at least you are somewhere. And I want you to now visualize your 50s and beyond. You probably are already there, uh, or you are close to there, or you have some time to get there. Uh, so if you if you're in your already in your fifties, uh, you would be more reflecting. Uh, what is the ideal? Uh, what is the vision that uh, you have? Uh, what do you want to see in your fifties? Uh, if you're already in your fifties, what's the legacy you would want to leave? I think that's how to look at it. What's the legacy you would want to leave? So I want you to look at the several windows we have talked about. Your marriage, your children, your health, and your wealth. And then now, I also want you to look at your kingdom assignment. So those are several windows. I want you to think about them for a moment. And I want you to ask yourself, are you prepared, you know, for your 50s and beyond? Are you scared about your 50s because of the mistakes 
probably have done between 30 and 50. What are, you know, it's like do a SWOT for yourself. What are some of the things that threaten your 50s and beyond? Now, what can you do now to start changing the trajectory of your life in regard to these things? What are the practical steps you can take now? Those are some of the things we need to, some of them would be very hard decisions. But what are the practical steps you can take now? If you have found yourself where, for example, your marriage, or, uh, you could be here divorced and single. Uh, I mean, divorced already, separated. The question would be, you know, um, when you look at your life, what is the kind of legacy would you want to leave? What is the kind of lessons are you picking from what happened in your marriage uh, going into your future? You know, uh, what is the kind of lessons do you want to draw from that? So that as you go into your future, you know, how do you deal with aloneness? Currently, you know, those are questions that we need to ask ourselves because they are real questions so that you protect yourself and you also uh, protect yourself from depression, protect yourself from, uh, you know, uh, being taken advantage of, uh, you know, Protect yourself uh, from vulnerability uh, and fulfill God's purpose and assignment. Uh, you know, because you still have an assignment and you still have a purpose in God. So uh, pull yourself together and keep going, you know to fulfill God's purpose and God's assignment in your life. Now, the weakest link in church among God's people is application. Think about it for a moment. Since you got born again, for those who are born again, I trust probably most of us are. Since you got born again, how many sermons have you had? How many sermons have been applicable in your life? You have applied yourself to them. I normally say, if we applied half of what we have had since we got born again, this world will be a different place. So that proves to us the weakest link in church is application. So these three days could be wasted or could be an investment depending on what you do with the information that you have received. What you do with the lessons that you have learned. So the last question. I've asked you many questions, but and I'm hoping you're thinking through as I talk. The last question, what is the Kairos word God has given you through these three days? Or even today, if you just came in today, God has spoken because God speaks. What is the word? What is 
that one word God has spoken to you as an instruction that, that my son, my daughter, this is what I'm speaking to you. This is what I'm saying you need to do. What is that word? And what are you going to do about it? The weakest link is application. Can we deal with that so that we can become stronger? We apply ourselves to the word. The Bible says if you look at the mirror, if you, if you listen to the word and don't do, you are like a man who looks at the mirror and immediately forgets what kind of a man he was. So obedience is not complete until we act on the word or instruction that God has given. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to us this three days as we reflect on marriage, as we recognize the value you have placed on the marriage union, as we listen to the instructions and the divine pattern and template of how to make mar our marriages work. Help us, O oh God, to be doers and not just hearers. Help us, O oh God, to respond to your voice. Whatever specific word, instruction that you're giving us, each one of us at our own individual space in our state, because you know each one of us where we are at. There are some of us who are single and they are trusting you, oh God, for relationships. There are some of us who are in marriages that are thriving. And this is a forum and a moment to be strengthened. There are some of us who are in marriages that are struggling. And that Lord, this becomes an opportunity to begin to turn that ship into the right direction. There are some of us, oh God, who uh, are launching alone. And this is a moment, oh God, uh, that your word is even ministering to them, strengthening them and helping them, oh God, to move forward and launch alone with you in their lives. I pray for every one of us. May these three days, oh God, be an investment that will prove helpful in our journey. Amen. So I release your grace upon each person, each marriage, mm -hmm. I release your grace that Lord, as we apply ourselves to your, your word and instruction, we will be able to experience the promise of your word. Mm -hmm. We will enjoy marriage and not endure it. Jesus. We will be a blessing to those around us and be a blessing to our children. And we will have impact for the kingdom wherever we are in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you richly. I trust uh, that's, that's it for from my side unless we have questions that we can respond to. Amen. Amen. We thank God so much for that timely word. Very profound, very needed. I will tell you, I did not know what direction God was taking this, but I knew he had a plan in mind for us from day one. And with that, it's amazing because everything he has spoken has really resonated with me from the beginning. A lot of light bulbs that, um, you know, came on and I said, ah, oh, that is why. Oh, that is why. So my advice for us um, is that we work on our marriages and think and reflect on these things now before it is too late. There are some of us who are suffering and um, are in a lot of 
difficulty and pain and we don't know where to go. Uh, we've tried everything. We've tried canceling. We've probably tried to work on our marriages for a very long time. And we are not aware of what, where or where we can find help. So um, I know there are some programs that are available and there is something that also um, a programs that Reverend Albert is going to share with us as well. So if you're here and you need help and you're in Kenya or even abroad, you can let us know um, some of the things that are there um, for couples, assistance, help. And feel free also to reach out to me. I put my number on the, uh, on the chat and I'll, I'll have Mili repost it again. I uh, will have Mili post the Kenyan number and the US number and feel free to contact us and we will be able to direct you to the right direction. We'll hook you up with resources that you actually need. Um, maybe uh, before I go on to um, what I needed to say or what I needed to uh, disclose to us today and share my heart with you, um, Reverend Albert, do you mind sharing about the program and what you're doing so that they can get the information now? Okay, um, as, a, as a church, we felt uh, in, in my attempt to try and help couples because as a pastor, you get to deal with many couples dealing with a lot of stuff. And one of the nagging questions is how do you help couples, uh, you know, process, uh, I mean, not get to the place where we are firefighting and we are, you know, dealing with issues at crisis level. How do you help couples, uh, you know, build their marriages and enjoy their marriages? Uh, in a more sustainable way, uh, you know, so there is this program that was developed by about 10 couples uh, who uh, had gone, grown to their 50s, they are retired, uh, they have raised their children, and some of them are divorced, uh, they had launched out alone, and some of them are still uh, married and enjoying their marriages. And so they came together. The divorced uh, shared their experiences of uh, what they could have done differently. Uh, you know, the married shared their experiences of how they have come along. And in the process, uh, they drew lessons and uh, these lessons were packaged into a program. Uh, so the program is called Zindua. It's a very good, healthy program uh, that helps couples. So that's what we are doing for our couples in church. And uh, when we talked with Minister Zawadi, she was asked, we were discussing about that thing and uh, we felt that it could be of help to some uh, who would need it. And so uh, I have a friend of mine uh, who uh, particularly specializes in this program and I could introduce uh, the person to us, but uh, I am available uh, depending on uh, prior arrangements on how we can do that if uh, a, a group of us need. Uh, the program runs for 11 weeks. It's easier, of course, when uh, it is in person, uh, but then uh, it, it can, it can uh, be done also out there. Uh, so it runs for 11 weeks uh, and, and it's a very interactive program uh, because it's not being taught. It's a different program from what, the way we do marriage seminars. It is uh, just, and it requires a lot of vulnerability and honesty. Uh, and in the process then a couple is helped. Uh, or couples are helped. And so it, it serves two purposes. It serves to help your marriage, but it also serves to build capacity in couples to become mentors for others, uh, which is something that is lacking in our day and time. So that's the program we do. And so uh, I think we can process that uh, should people need that program, uh, we can process that. And I think through uh, Zawadi, we can talk about it.
you you're muted you're muted thank you so much <laughs> All right, so thank you so much for that. Go ahead and just, um, you have my number there, you can get in touch with me and then we can always hook you up with the right resources. Um, I want to um, take this opportunity and very humbly let you know how we started this three-day marriage. And a lot of people think that there are some things that you start because you're successful at it. But actually, the three-day marriage prayer did not begin because I was successful in my marriage. It began because my marriage was dead, basically. And um, it was at a very, very deep point. I believe it was the, uh, December of 2020 that I had gone into a, de a depression and I couldn't get off my couch. I couldn't even do videos or um, anything. I was depressed. I was suppressed. My children were actually my counselors. And it got to a place where it became that I couldn't even pray. Um, my marriage has taken a very long journey. Uh, 23 years, I got married when I was 19. And a couple of times in my marriage, um, it started, it went to, from physical abuse and that ended in a couple arrests and that ended in, um, now, since you know there are consequences for physical abuse, it went into emotional abuse. And the emotional abuse stayed there, and then it also went into fidelity. And um, like one of us said that, what do you do when somebody cheats on you over and over and over and over? There's one time, one time it's, oops, well, you know what? I did wrong, I'm sorry, I wanna change, right? And we can talk about that. And maybe you go like, okay, you know, I, I, I fell again in sin and it's a different way. Okay, let's talk about it. You wanna get it better, let's make it better. I don't say you need to leave somebody because they cheated on you once or twice for that matter. But when it comes to three times, four times, then now we are, we're talking, uh, there's a problem that actually needs to be solved. There are boundaries that need to be made and there are things that we need to address. Um, so my marriage suffered a lot of that um, in contributory to as well. Like I said, we got married at 19. At 20, I also thought, you know what? You cheated on me, I try and cheat on you. But that didn't work for me because I was, I felt very guilty doing that. And I went back and, and I reported myself and I said, you know what? My bad, this is not working. But then on the other end, it just kept on going and going. So for, for him, it wasn't a big deal. But for me, it was like, that's not how you solve problems by hitting back in the same way you were hit, right? So learning to live um, a marriage that you can't trust, but seek God. A marriage where you're so depressed, where the, you get to a place where you're so down, you can't talk to anybody about it because then if you do, you're in trouble, right? And there is no empathy. I got to a place where I tried to kill myself twice because of my marriage. The second time, actually God is the one who stopped me from jumping over a cliff when he said, what is this in you that the devil is so afraid of that he wants you dead so bad? Then I realized I have a greater purpose in me, that marriage is not my life. Purpose. God is more interested in my purpose. He never said, why are you leaving your children and your husband? Why, why don't you look at, at what I've given you? Why are you leaving your cars? Why are you living in a big house, yet you're going to kill yourself? God never showed me about property. He talked about my destiny and he talked about my purpose. And he said, what is this in you? What purpose that I created you to do that the devil is so afraid of that he wants you dead so bad? So when he ignited me into my purpose, I woke up and I started seeking my worth in God because I was trying to look for my worth in my husband, which I never found. I never found in the 23 years my worth at all. So when I went in to seek my worth from Christ, then I got deeper in him and deeper in love with Jesus and to a place where I knew him for, for myself, not because I went to church, not because oh, I'm religious, not you have to get to know God for yourself. So even after that, years later, like I'm saying, I'm talking about 2020 is when um, I hit rock bottom again. And I knew I was staying in this for my kids because I did not want my children to not have a father. 
or a resident father, but either way, he was not around because he traveled a lot. He was, he was a truck driver, so he traveled a lot and he went so much. When my sons looked at me and they asked me, mom, why even bothered with him? What is going on? Why are you doing this to yourself? And I had to sneak out one time and fly out to where he was to just try and fix my marriage because my children had said, do not dare leave this place. And when you put your children into a position where now they have to play your counselors, you're actually now hurting your children more than you're fixing it. So sometimes staying for your children, and, and, and for me, I thought I was doing the right thing to stay for my children. And that's what I heard, I'm, I'm with you because of the children. But the problem is you stay for your children. Are they going to learn? My fear is, or rather I, I'm not fe fearful because I've left my children to God, but was that a good example of for a length of time for them to learn how to be a husband? Did I expose them to toxicity for too long, thinking that I was actually helping them to stay with a father? Those are the things that I, I, I pray and I say, God, let it not be that I made the decision to stay um, long enough. But then God himself had to come and intervene because I didn't have the strength to go. So one day I was actually outside and I told God, you know what? I can't talk to my mother. I can't talk to anybody else. I don't have anybody. It is you between you and me. I have tried to fix my marriage even after I left and went there, it was still futile. I felt like I was on life support and my marriage was basically dead. And God told me, I want you to start the three day marriage prayer. There are many marriages that are struggling and suffering like you. And I'm like, seriously, okay. So I jumped on it and I said, okay, maybe when I do this and as I do this, God is going to fix my marriage, right? And I'm so excited. I'm like, okay, maybe this will get me out of this depression. <laughs> Let's go and see what we can do. And I said, in fact, if you look at January 2021 is when we started and we never started from the first, second and third because it was uh, what triggered this was I, I used to attend um, a, like a prayer session for an, an Arizonian group. And for some reason, that same time, the pastor, whoever was leading said that there are so many marriages of ministers that are suffering and they need prayer. And I felt so like, wow, I'm not alone. And so when I started this, I actually said, we're gonna do it before the 10th day of the month so that we can get it done. And then I was like, the devil, we have to stop you before you get into marriages every first, second and third so that we take precedence of our marriages. And as we're doing that, God tells me, he shows me actually leaving Egypt because I told him I'm going to die in this marriage because I'm not getting beat up, but I'm emotionally drained. I don't, he's, he's a non-resident husband and father He's always gone, but then there's always shouting and noise. And you know, there's a lot of emotional stress and abuse. And so I said, I'm going to stay here as long as you need me to stay here. And if I'm, my life is, this is for your glory, for me to die in this marriage, I choose death for your glory. I will die here, but I'm not going to leave anywhere that you haven't told me to leave. So that night he showed me leaving Egypt. And then actually Jesus Christ came and sat with me on the bed. And he's, he opened scripture and he said that Peter asked me, what about us who have left everything to follow you? What is there in return? And Jesus said, and I answered him, anybody who has left father, mother, brother, sister, spouse, children, lands, properties for my namesake will get more in this life and in the life to come. And then he said, you are not fulfilling your purpose. You need to leave him now because you are leaving him for my kingdom, for my purpose. Right now you're depressed. You can't pray. You can't fulfill purpose. People are waiting all over the place for you, but you cannot do my, my kingdom assignment that I've given you because you're depressed. You're suppressed. You're almost killing yourself. You're, there's really nothing you can do. And then he also said one time to me that I am tired of fixing you every single time only to give you up to him for him to break you again. And so it was a cycle, God got tired of it. And then he still told me that, and Jesus is sitting on my bed, but how many people know that when you're trauma bonded, you're trauma bonded and there's really no way you, I believe in marriage, I am a pro marriage person. There is no way God is gonna fix this. You know, God told me to start this ministry, meaning he wants to fix my marriage. So I still persist and then, the second time I get a dream, I get a dream that he was driving his truck 
and he had his friends in the front of the truck. And my children and I were in the back of the truck. And as I was looking through the window to see, I saw his friend sitting in the front and I was looking at, I was looking and I'm looking at him, he's driving, his friends are in the front. My children are busy on their phones. You know how kids really, you know, get busy. And I'm thinking to myself in this dream, don't, aren't my children and I supposed to be at the front of the truck and his friends at the back? I'm confused. Like I don't, I, all of a sudden as I'm thinking that I see an orange truck coming like head on. But this orange truck, I realize it's his friend. Um, and then uh, my ex-husband, because now um, we are divorced, my ex-husband actually now looks, he, he's, he's happy because he thinks, oh, this is my friend. We're going to come in and he's going to swab out. And so, because he's my friend. And I'm looking, I'm watching the whole thing. And the orange truck comes and crashes on his side. He was the driver's side, crashes him completely, flattens his body and chops his head off outside the window. And that is the most devastating dream I've ever had ever since I knew who I was. I woke up shaking. I, what, he's out of state, obviously, because that's where he, he works. I, I, I am, I'm, I'm trying to call. I woke up to call him. It was like three in the morning. And I said, no, I can't call because I am so shaken. Let me pray fast. So I pray, I pray, I pray. And then I call him and he says, oh yeah, that's just a dream. There's really nothing, right? So he dismisses that. And then later on, the Holy Spirit tells me that that orange truck was God. That was the fire of God. It was him not happy about how he had put him as the head of his family, but yet we were in the trunk, how he treated me and the children. So he actually dethroned him from being head of household. All right. Then the second dream I had was that my husband and I, we were uh, my ex, sorry. And I, we were walking with our, a ring that had the diamonds were almost all gone. Like it was maybe one or two diamonds. And so we went to ask who can fix this ring. And the people around told us there's only one genuine diamond repairer. And they showed us where he was. So we went to that man and we said, sir, um, we've been told you're the only diamond repairer. And he says, yes, I am. And so we gave him the ring and he looked at it and he looked at it and he looked at it and he said, he gave it back to us. He says, this one is beyond repair. You must get a new one. He gave it back to us. That's dream number two. So I'm like still persistent because, hey, God is going to work this out, right? And I'm telling him all these dreams and all there's really nothing that is happening. Oh, you know what? No, um, he continues, you know, it's just a dream. The third dream that I had, I found myself in a reception. And a reception and that it was almost like after a wedding reception, and I have, there is a man sitting on my left side and there is a woman, a lady, very nice lady sitting on my right side. And we are on the high table and there are guests, but I see my ex-husband as a guest eating with the guests. And this lady is so nice to me, but the gentleman on my right side, I hear he's my husband, now my new husband, but he's on the phone. I couldn't, I'm confused. I'm in this dream and I'm like, what is going on here? He's on the phone, so I can't talk to him. I, 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 I see just the phone, the part up to here. I don't see the top of his face because he's on the side. And then I see this lady is so nice to me. So I get to talk to this lady and I said, excuse me, ma'am. How did I get up? Mar how did I end up getting married to your son? And then she points out to my ex and she says, because of his anger and he's a dictator. I woke up. And I told him that dream too. And I'm like, we really need to work on something. There is something here. There's a trend and still nothing. So as we are going on with this marriage uh, prayers, um, Reverend Albert was introduced and he came in as a guest. And interestingly enough, I was like, wow, this is what we are going through. Um, and we really, I wish we could get help. Already God has told me to leave my, uh, my ex, but I'm still insisting that I think God wants to heal my marriage because he told me to start this ministry. And we even tried canceling, but like I said, and they, you know, I was so sure that we are going to work out, but it was too late for us because we waited too long. God already had ended my marriage. Look at the truck. Jesus, the only diamond repairman, Look at the diamonds. He says, I, I can't not repair this marriage. It's done. 
Look at the, the, the replacement already. He has already been replaced. There is no way out. And it's because of anger and dictatorship. I am, we tried, but nothing happened. And that's why it is very critical for you guys to do what you need to do now before God himself steps in and ends your marriage. Because there are some things that are costly to the kingdom and God will not choose your marriage over kingdom. He will not. He doesn't joke. The first, the final one, I'm still staying. And I, I, if you can remember, I started posting some of uh, me and him, a picture of, in fact, when Reverend Albert came, we had a, a poster with a picture of um, my ex and I. And because I was saying, oh, now he, he came, because he never used to attend any of, of my meetings, but now he came and he says, I wanna be a part of this. I wanna try, because after I told him, God said to leave him, he started now trying to work it out again. But then it was only short lived and it went back to where it used to be. Because how many people know that when a cycle of abuse, it's just a cycle. There is love bombing, there is attention building, and there is, when you're in a toxic relationship, it is the same cycle. The last thing that happened in my life to know that I need to get out was I had the fourth dream. And I know some of you are asking, Zawadi, God already spoke. Why are you still staying? He came and, and he's sitting down with you and telling you, this, why are you still here? Why are you still in this toxic relationship and subjecting your children to this? There is a time that your trauma bonded and there's really, you don't have the strength to get yourself out. And for me, I'm the person that I don't do things that God hasn't said and spoken and actually verified. So the fourth dream comes in. And in this dream, I hear that I, I will, I'm told that I had breast cancer. And I refused to check my breast, it was my left breast. And so in the dream, I call a friend who was um, he, he, uh, a friend of actually, I was introduced to my husband. So she comes in and I tell her, I was being told that I have cancer in my breast, but I'm not, uh, I have lumps in my breast, but I do not know, I, I, I don't want to touch it. I'm afraid to touch it. And so she says, oh, let me touch. And she touched and she felt two lumps, one big one, one small one. And she said, we have to go immediately to the emergency room. And at the corner of the room, I, I saw my, uh, my ex just looking at me from a distance. So we went to the doctor and he took pictures and he showed me these are cancerous, they have to be removed, went into surgery, took out the, the cancerous um, lumps. And after the surgery, I did not see my ex again. I did not see my, my husband then again. It, it was done. And so I'm shaken. I went to work the following morning. I don't know what is this thing is all about. And as I'm taking my walk, God speaks audibly and he tells me, I am the one who has ended your marriage, not you. Get out now. That was enough for me to say, you know what? I think I've had enough. And so the reason why I'm sharing this is because there's so many people who have missed purpose, so many people who have died. And I asked God, I asked him, I thought you're supposed to be fixing my marriage. I thought you told me this to start because then you're supposed to fix it so that people can see that there is a, a, an after, a good place after. I think it's a really nice, you know, this is what I thought you, we, the plan was because you are a God who there is nothing impossible with you. But you know what he said? He says, no, no, because there has been evil doctrine out there that I want people to stay until they die that I want people to stay and compromise their kingdom purpose. People are going to and missing eternity because of marriages. You have made marriages your gods. You are not fulfilling purpose because of your spouse. You have put them before Christ. And Christ says, you must, he, I did not come to bring peace. I came to bring division. You must follow me. If your spouse is not following me, you do not follow your spouse. I am the one you follow. I am the creator, not the created. I am the one who ends marriages and I'm the one who begins them. I'm the one who starts things. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And yes, I have a right to end any marriage I want to end. 
And you cannot put me in a box that I hate divorce because I also hate people who do not fulfill and accomplish their kingdom purpose. It will not be compromised because of selfishness, because of hardness of heart, because of refusing to work on your marriage, because of mistreating and treating your, the wife of your youth the way you want, because at the end of the day, I am a father and I have Jesus is the wife. And as a father, I cannot sit down and allow you to mistreat my child. So if you're a woman and you're mistreating your husband, their father is watching and he will come and do what he needs to do as a father. If you are there and you're mistreating the bride of Christ, Jesus is watching. And when you take your ring to him, he will look at it and say, this is beyond repair. I will not fix it. I will have to give them a new one. And it will be a sad day because then you will be the fool that Nabal was. And he lost not only his life, not only his livelihood, but he also lost his wife to the king that he tried to reject, the king that he insulted. When you are mistreating your spouse, you're insulting God because he has commanded you to love your spouse as Christ loves the church. He has given you his child. And it is for kingdom purpose for you to work together in unity, to grow the kingdom, not to separate it. So today I'm coming to you to tell you that after 23 years, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit have ended my marriage. And I am so glad that they did because I couldn't. But right now, I am so excited to be a daughter of the Most High God, the bride of Christ, and the friend of the Holy Spirit. And they bought me a new ring. So if you see me wearing a ring, don't think it's a, I'm, still, I'm still attached, no. The ring that is the most beautiful ring that I've ever had in my life, that I've, I don't even think, but it is from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that this comes first. My kingdom purpose comes first. I am first a daughter of the most high God. I am the bride of Christ and the friend of the Holy Spirit. And if there is anybody who will come, will have to be brought by God himself. So don't even think of anything. There is no, there is no, uh, if the announcement is not because there is, a, there is a void. There is no void. It has already been filled. And when he says it is not good for Zawadi to be alone, who am I to say it is good, right? So today, let me tell you, be careful. God is not a joker. That is what I will tell you. My daddy does not joke around. My husband, my bridegroom, Jesus, he does not mess around. When it comes to his church, he takes it personally. So be very careful with the spouse that God has entrusted you with. Because if you're not careful, they will be taken away from you and you will have nothing to say. So today I'm going to share a link. It will be on my YouTube. I will release it today. I needed to talk to you first before I release it to the world because I, you're my family and we're here together. We are, we, are, we are trying to work out marriage together. And there is no way I'm, not, I'm gonna stop being passionate about marriage, no. I am passionate about what my daddy is passionate about. I am passionate about what God is passionate about. I am his daughter. I am the bride of Christ and a friend of the Holy Spirit. And it will always be that way because I am about my father's business. And I pray that all of us wake up to the realization that you cannot be mediocre anymore. A shifting is coming and the kingdom has suffered violence. It has been suppressed for too long. But God is coming to bring a shift and it will start in the church. He will rearrange things and he has to put compatible partners because the kingdom, you see, the Bible says that he will be glorified. It is about time that he gets glorified. The enemy has glorified himself too long. He has come, he has caused every divorce. He has caused all this homosexuality and all these crazy marriages all over the place. He has, brought, he has done his work just like he came to do Job's work. And God said, okay, do finish. Are you done? Because now it is about time that I come and do what I do best so that I may be glorified. It's time I come back now to bring, it's a comeback of the church and a comeback of the kingdom that people, they will have no doubt 
that there is a God in heaven who knows what marriage is about and who created marriage and who understands marriage. So today, I just want to say I love you all and thank you so much for being here because you have no idea. All along, it was therapy for me. All along, you thought I was I'm coming to help you out. No, you helped me out. You really did. You came and we grew together. You helped me heal. And I'm so grateful for you. I'm so, so grateful for you. I'm so grateful for what God is doing. There are so many marriages that have been healed here. We remember even Fiona's marriage. She even testified. Many marriages have been healed. So it is not a bad thing. Just like Jesus Christ died and rose again for us, my marriage had to die for other marriages to rise again. Other marriages to come up again. For you to get this information from Reverend Albert, very critical information that you can be able to rise again and start thinking about your marriage. Mine had to die. So I thank God so much for you and I bless you. I pray that you can only go up from here. You know, once you hit rock bottom, there is no going down anymore. It's only up from here. Don't allow yourself to go down. Let's go all from here, all from here. We must go up from here. We only must go up from here. So I love you so much for the love of Christ. Look out for that video. It's gonna be online. I'm gonna release it shortly. And then you can, you can get the fullness of the story, but I thought I would share it with my family. And so that way you hear from me because you're the ones who come here every month and listen to me. And I thought it was important for me to um, let you know. If you have any questions, ask. Ask me any questions you'd like to ask. This is your time, your family. Like I said, I'm going to reveal um, whatever it is that you want. You can ask any questions that you have for me or uh, Reverend Albert, and he can. we're going to answer you today before we end this. So Heather, you have your hand up. I'm going to give you um, ability to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, no questions, but just to say thank you for sharing and it's still a great ministry that you've started and uh, nothing will nothing will come between it but the potholes and the trials that you've you've been through it firsthand, I would say. And I think the anointing on your life would even increase even more because of the experience and the journey that you have had. So um, I'm going through mine, <laughs> the, uh, just just the same. Um, my uh, date is next week, Thursday. Um, my uh, after waiting from 2019 for after filing from 2019, my actual divorce date is uh, next week. And yes, throughout this week, I was thinking, uh, should I give him a call? How is he? he doing you know because now it's, it's coming up to that time this is it now um should i give him a call see how he's feeling if, if he's ready to embrace this and you 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 lie back and you reflect you know and you you reflect and you think okay where did we go wrong what could have we, we, we could have done differently but one of the things uh i i i i am glad that i am not uh, bitter because I am wholeheartedly still able to pray for him and if I see him doing successful all honor and glory still goes to God you know and I'm glad I, I can look at it for that perspective and I went to see a musical about Bob Marley <laughs> and he considered himself as a messenger but looking at his life story how he started and some of the things his wife had to go through um, it, 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 it was uh, amazing. And even through his illness, he continued because he believed he had a message, you know, but he hurt a lot of women in, be in, in between as well. Uh, he was going out having all these children and sending them back home to his wife to raise. And <laughs> can you imagine his wife hardly saw him, but she was raising all these children by other women that he was having from all his escapade and, and, and tours, you know, but it's, it's amazing how um, God can bring us through a trialing and uh, testing uh, period, but we, we come out stronger and the anointing is even greater 
on, on, on your life. So thanks for sharing. And I'll continue to lift you up in prayer as well, that you know that the healing process is speedily and uh, you know nothing nothing is lost all all that's left is what what is there to gain because um god is full of love and he will restore uh anything that the enemy think that he has an advantage he hasn't won he's he, he's never won never will and there's no chance of winning <laughs> you know so i'm 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 happy for you and i hope you continue and you still continue to feel empowered because it's been a blessing every month that we am able to come on and share. So thank you. Thank you so much. That is such a blessing. I like what you said that um, giving it not from a place of bitterness, you can never live in bitterness. You can only live in love. And yes. I, I could not say, okay, from a place of bitterness to leave. I could only yield to the, you know, to the will of God. And I love him mm -hmm. with all my heart. And it's such mm -hmm. a good thing, you know, to be able to, to know who God is and know that he's love and know that he loves his sons and daughters. And I pray mm -hmm. that he always fulfills his purpose. Yes. You know, yes. Always pray. You always pray. So it's, it, he's, he's, uh, he, he doesn't stop being a brother. He doesn't stop being somebody that God loves. No. And I love mm -hmm. him so much with all my heart. And so yeah. I like that you said that we cannot have any root of bitterness in us because guess mm -hmm. what? as long as you have given everything you have, there's one thing my father always told me. He says, baby girl, whatever it is you do, I want you to do it, to give everything you have that when you stand before the throne room of God, you will not have anything to answer. It will not have like you have, you could have done this or this. Make sure you have crossed your teeth and dotted your eyes and everything that it was in your power to do, you have done. And when uh -huh. you do that, that's when God steps in, right? Uh -huh. So uh -huh. thank you so much. Yeah, from love, a lot of love. We have to do this out of love. And thank you, Heather. For, yeah. For what a blessing. And we love you. you. <laughs> we love you as well. You so love you. <laughs> okay. Oh, and thanks to uh, the pastor Albert as well for for his words. I listened, I think, the last couple of days, and there were lots lots of nuggets as well. So um, I've taken some down. And one thing I've prayed, I've asked the Lord just to to guard my heart and to you know, so anyone that comes close, like, I'm like you. I said, well, anyone else, God has to bring bring this one. I'm not I'm not choosing. And I I hear people say, oh, you know write the vision, make it plain. I said, I'm not asking for no tall, slim, nothing. God knows the right person for me. I want, and it's God's best. It can't be any less than God's best. So I just ask God to just guard that area so that the enemy doesn't try and think he can I'll come and poke with somebody, somebody else comes, comes and poke you because I'm about God's will and purpose at, as, as well. So um, it's, it's an awesome time. I'm excited for you know what the next phase and journey of of our lives as well so uh yeah just i'll stop there <laughs> thank you so much i appreciate it god bless you so much yeah we we stay about our, our father's business and he will he will if he sees that we are doing whatever we need and we need a help I, he sure he did for Ab, uh, adam and eve and so yeah let him let him be the one to figure it out I don't amen amen <laughs> All right, Uka, go for it. All right, I just wanted to thank you guys for having this ministry and I am so glad to hear you and I, I'm so glad to see you smile and just hearing you say that, uh, because for me, I always feel like joy. There's nothing like joy, no matter what you go through and you started this ministry and I see you now, you say your marriage is ending, but you, just like you said it, you say it's God's purpose. And nothing like you say, like when you come to realize yourself, nobody can minister for you. You have to sometimes minister for yourself. And for me through life, I have gone there and know it's not church, it's not the pastor, it's not anybody. You have to get to a time, yeah, the church and the ministry, like we come, helps but you have to come in time of yourself when you go through stuff and know that i can go to god 
and I can tell him things and he can tell me things. So, and I am so glad and I am so happy where you are and just to see you uh, lighting up my day. I still have to go for my things and my exams and everything, but just you reminding me, I say, oh, let me join before I go, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I am so happy. Um, I do have a friend that is going through the same thing and I have tried a couple of, you know, and that's why I'm asking for the information. So at least maybe she can have a platform that I have been inviting her in this too, you know, to try to come, you know, I know she's busy. She haven't, I don't think she have joined, but I will keep on inviting her. And I think uh, you will be a lot of source of strength for her because she have a lot of strength too. And she believes in God and she prays a lot. And um, she have gone through basically what, you just said oh and she have been in it for this number of years you have been through um and she have tried to work it out here and there but it's not working out but i would gladly like to have the information that you have and the pastor have and i will if it's okay with you i will also give her your contact yes. so she can contact you because i think it will be such a blessing to her and I thank you and the Reverend for having this platform. It have blessed me so much. I am not having, uh, I am traveling in my marriage, I will say that, but I only know it's because of God's strength. Just like you say, sometimes you have to talk through the hard stuff sometimes, but sometimes even people, they talk through the hard stuff and still it doesn't work out. So, but I feel blessed uh, that I'm still in mine and, um, you know, God is blessing us and helping us work things out. But at the same time, uh, you know, I am happy to be a part of this and, you know, to, you know, if, if there's any way I can help in any platform, I know I'm busy and you keep on bringing me to this. And I just wanted to thank you. I'm, I'm just happy that I, I'm able to finally get to it you have invited me so many times so many times i come and i don't come but you know it's just such a blessing and joy and i thank everyone and i am so so happy to be a part of this and i would like it to grow because it is really needed even my i have a niece in canada that i'm trying to i send him the information because he's trying to get married but he was raised his dad and mom they really believe us and everything you know, but he was talking to me one time and he's like, like, auntie, I know, but I think this would be such a blessing to him, even though he's a young guy, he's trying to get into marriage, but he's really, he said, I don't want to make mistakes. Like you were saying, it's not the blood of God that they have bought or we have wig, we have makeup and we look all nice. That's all not what you need in marriage. You need more than that, you know, mm -hmm. so to be happy. So I am so happy and I am so happy for this platform. And I just can't wait to see what God will bring, bring from you because you're doing this for God's purpose and God knows reason for that. And I am so happy and I can't just wait. I know there's a lot more for you and you know, just wait because God is God and he knows why he did that. So, and I am glad that you listen to him because you know you have to. So, so. I am so happy and happy for you and what you're doing. And I can't wait to see what God has for us in this, uh, in this ministry. So thank you, Reverend, and thank you, everybody. I am so happy to be here today. I didn't want to, I was like, I don't know if I will stay today, but I just, for some reason, my mind said, okay, you have to be in this today and you have to be in the video all through. I didn't know, but it's, it's a reason, there's, there was a reason why God did that. And, you know, I am so happy and thank you everyone and thank God for what he's doing and what he will do in the future. God bless you all. Amen. Thank you so much, Uka, my friend Uka. I love you so much with the love of Christ. And you know, you mentioned something that I need to say. A lot of people need this. And so from next month, we're going to be doing one for the night. Remember, Uka and I were in California. We're going to be doing an, our night one, Uka, because right now it's during the day. A lot of people are at work. We're yeah, doing a, a night one and 8, 8 p.m. I'll hook up with you and then we'll see how we can get this going. Also, yeah. first, second and third, our night in the U.S. That way we have people joining. That, so, yeah. that would be great. That would be, I, I can't wait because 
a lot of people need it. There are things like I tell people, it's not something you can walk. You need God, God's grace to do certain stuff. And it's only by his grace that you're doing what you're doing and being happy. And, you know, so it's him, it's him. And he know what he's doing. Yes. Thank you so much. God you. bless you. I, I love you so much. Yes, love Abigail. <laughs> bless you all. Thank you, Sister Gift. Thank you so much. I'm not being cliche. I just want to, sorry, I'm driving. I'm going to be quick. Um, I just want to thank um, Reverend Albert as well and all the people that have contributed. You know, Jesus came, he died for each and every one of us. And he's, he, the pain that he went through set my kind free. Now, you've gone through some trials and tribulation, your young, you know, your, your marriage, and you stood in there. But that pain has birthed out this ministry and um, setting a lot of people free. So I want you to take that as an encouragement. Because, you know, it may, you may just be one person that's gone through your relationship. I know there's many others, but we thank God for your life because you've saved somebody, you know, because we're not married to the ministry. Through marriage, a lot of people have been murdered. A lot of people are in mental health homes. Children have been in, we heard recently in America, there's this family that had some issue. I can't remember the state where it was. And then um, the man was seeing the children, you know, um, in a church, they meet up. I think it was in California just recently. And he shot all the three children dead. You know, so those are situations that may not be all the time that happens, but these are things that happen. So when we have platforms like these, these things save us, you know, and it helps us as Christians to walk in, not our own wisdom or understanding, but in the wisdom of Christ. So I just want to thank God that, you know, God has used you to bring out, you know, the, 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 your, what you went through as a lesson to each and every one of us. And I want to also thank Pastor Albert, you know, for coming and teaching us and you know the gift you said that's the, they always say the gift that you have it's not for yourself it's for other people so i just want to thank god for you and i pray that as you go through you know the 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 divorce you and your family that god will cover you with the blood of jesus that god will bring healing and divine intervention quickly you know and then um, god will continue to rest up when you rest upon a ministry i see you coming to london really soon i don't know when but i know you're going to travel around the world and you're going to make you know headlines in jesus name Amen. God bless you. Bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Love you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What an encouragement. How amazing that what God does, sometimes what the enemy means for evil, God turns it around for good. Had he known just that killing Christ or putting him on the cross would have caused a resurrection on the third day for so many of us, he wouldn't have tried it. And unfortunately today, like I said, today's the third month on the third day the resurrection so if he knew killing my marriage would bring this i think he would have let it left it alone <laughs> but we thank god so much i am so grateful i i love you so much with the love of christ there is so much i want you guys if you feel whatever it is that you feel the either timings or whatever we can increase meetings okay we are going to be able to put it in such a way that the holy spirit can reach out to the world if uh, we can start it in different places just let me know uh, we already registered our ministry, Holy Ghost Impartation Ministries. And so we are just there to be about our father's business. Love you so much with the love of Christ. And before we leave, I would just say, if there's anybody else with a question, just feel free to unmute and ask the question before I ask Reverend Albert to close again, <laughs> to now close us with a word of prayer until next month. It seems that we are good. Nobody has a question or a comment. All right, Reverend Alba, please um, close for us with a word of prayer. All right, uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing. I mean, it's been a great three days and then uh, hearing you being vulnerable and sharing your testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, we. We thank God for you. And like you said, we thank God that, uh, you know, through your uh, pain, uh, something was birthed that is going to be a blessing to others. So with this platform, uh, many will be helped uh, in their marriages. And I pray that, uh, you know, because of this platform, uh, you know, interventions will come. 
uh, that will save many marriages uh, in the process. And so we pray for God's healing and God's help. Uh, and it's good to see the joy of the Lord in you, uh, despite what you have had to deal with. All right. Uh, I think one question that was asked to me directly that I will just respond to quickly and then pray. Uh, somebody was asking about, I think they are in this, they are either having uh, something with a particular person uh, who is in the process of divorce and uh, it's taken long for them to actually divorce. Uh, they are already in, I think, in the divorce process, but it's not yet finalized. And they are back and forth with information as in their, sometimes they talk, sometimes they don't, if I got it right. And so uh, this sister is at a loss as to know what does she do with this person. Uh, I, Many times when you get a question that is very personal, uh, it's difficult to give a straight jacket answer because uh, it probably will require interaction to be able to get the full context and then advise appropriately. But uh, from where I stand right now, I would probably say uh, when a person is dealing with divorce, uh, it's usually a heavy story. Uh, it's whether you are the victim or the, you know, the one, whichever, the, the, the one who is largely responsible or largely the victim, because uh, there is always, uh, it rips you apart. It's like uh, death. So there is a mourning uh, because that's a death of a marriage and it's a loss of a person that you once loved. And so there is a sense in which uh, you are going to go through this uh, mourning period. So it's like death. When you lose somebody, uh, a loved one, uh, whether they have was a relationship or not, uh, there is a sense in which you, you feel something about the loss that you have had. Uh, whether it was uh, right, uh, I mean, it should have happened or not, uh, you still feel something uh, because there was a part of your life you gave to this person for that period of time. So now because of that, uh, I usually feel uh, you need to process that before you come into another relationship. Uh, because if you don't do that, chances are the very reasons that led to the divorce can lead to another divorce. Secondly, uh, you develop, uh, you know, th there, there is a definite, psychologically, uh, trusting another will take you a bit of time. And uh, when you allow somebody else into your life, uh, before you process this thing, uh, what happens is that you tend to judge the other person be, uh, based on your previous person. And that can become a thing that will compromise your relationship. And so for me, my take would be this person needs time to process this uh, before they uh, are sure and they are sober enough to enter into another relationship. Uh, Otherwise, you would be allowing somebody that comes into a relationship that is not fully dealt with their past relationship uh, into your life. And so them processing them, it with you might end up, uh, you know, creating, sabotaging your very relationship that you're in now. Uh, so that's my general perspective without going into the specific of what's going on in actually that relationship. Uh, so for me, the person needs to process their divorce, finish with their divorce uh, before they think of another relationship with you.
Yeah, you shouldn't be in a relationship with that person until they process and they are done with uh, their past relationship. It needs to be behind them and they need to heal from it, you know, uh, before they think of getting into another relationship. I think that's probably what I would say about that. Uh, so whoever asked, I know has gotten my response. If you need to hear from me more, uh, you could uh, talk to uh, Zawadi and she will be able to uh, help you get me. You can now touch base, talk more. Uh, so thank you. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, wonderful uh, platform that you have granted us to learn, uh, to talk marriage, and to be able to, uh, you know, strengthen our marriages, oh God, so that, uh, you know, your, your, your will and purpose concerning the marriage institution can be able to be uh, actualized, oh God, uh, in our lives. And so, Lord, I bless each and every person that has been through this program uh, or this platform for the last three days. I pray, oh God, that uh, in whatever space they are in and state they are in, that Lord, you will minister to them at a very personal level for the glory of your name. Thank you for uh, Minister Zawadi who has uh, you know, responded to your call to create this platform and uh, you know, despite uh, her pain, oh God, yet she was able to come to a place of birthing this. And we pray for her, that Lord, you will minister to her. You will bring complete healing and wholeness to her, oh God, that every uh, effect and consequence of uh, the stuff that she has had to deal with and go through, uh, that Lord, you will heal her from that in the name of the Lord. And that, Lord, your grace will continue to flow. Thank you because you are the God who gives grace that is always sufficient uh, for anything that we are dealing with. And that, Lord, your strength is made perfect in our weaknesses. So may your strength be made perfect in her life, uh, oh God. And let your grace be sufficient. And even for the call and the passion she has for you, and the call to fulfill your purpose and assignment, I pray for multiplied grace and the anointing of God upon our life to continue to flourish and to flow in the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I bless each one of us. Give us uh, uh, the rest of the day, evening, morning. Uh, give us a blessed day before us, oh God, and cause us to be able to meet again when this is possible next month for the glory of your name. We thank you and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Take care. Thank you. you. See you again next month. Thank Bye. you.